It is an honor and a pleasure to introduce the Secretary of Veterans Affairs, the Honorable Robert McDonald. Secretary McDonald is a 1975 graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point, an alumnus of the University of Utah, where he earned an MBA. An Army veteran and both airborne and ranger qualified, he served with the 82nd Airborne Division. Upon leaving military service, Captain McDonald was awarded the Meritorious Service Medal. In 1980, Mr. McDonald joined Procter & Gamble, a Fortune 50 company, and he rose through the ranks to become its chief executive officer and president. He retired in June of 2013. Nominated by President Obama as the eighth Secretary of Veterans Affairs on June 30th, he was confirmed by the United States Senate on July 29th, 2014. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Secretary of Veterans Affairs, Robert McDonald. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's terrific to be here with you this morning, and I appreciate all of you who had to fight the weather to, uh, to get here. Uh, I was out last night, and I know how difficult it was. Many thanks to Brenda for that uh, wonderful introduction. Brenda, if you have any issues with your leg, let me know, because it's my fault. And, uh, I will do everything I can to make sure that doesn't happen for Brenda and everyone else in this room. I also want to thank uh, Ron Hope. Ron's a terrific leader. Uh, he's the leader I want to be someday. Uh, my wife and I have been thrilled to be with Ron and, and his family uh, at Veterans Day and, and throughout the year, and it's just great working with Ron. You know, we really think of you all in DAV as true partners in trying to get our mutual mission of caring for veterans uh, done. Many thanks to Mark Burgess, of course, the adjutant, uh, David Tannenbaum, Secretary Treasurer, uh, Leanne Karg for her work as the uh, Auxiliary National Commander, uh, John Kleindienst who uh, directs the volunteers, and of course my friend Gary Augustine who works here with us in Washington uh, every single day. Great partnership and we are really thrilled. Um, we can't do this job by ourselves, we know that, and we know that the partnership with you all is absolutely essential to get that done. And uh, thank you so much for your partnership with the uh, Winter Sports Clinic. Uh, I'm looking forward to this, clinic, this year's clinic in, uh, in April. And we hope to see some of you uh, in snow mass uh, for that clinic. Thanks also for your support with the VA Caregiver Support Program. I'm gonna talk more about that later. I know that's a very important topic to us and it's one we need to be, um, be on the forefront on uh, as we go to talk to members of Congress. But let me talk for a few minutes about the VA and, uh, and what we're attempting to do. You know, my life's purpose has been to try to improve lives, and I've done that in various different ways throughout my life. Uh, believe it or not, these four, five pictures are of the same individual. Um, <laughs> on the far left, you've kind of got this geeky looking guy, and uh, my wife's never seen that picture, by the way. But, uh, but when I was young, I was a Boy Scout, you know, and I love the Boy Scouts. And the thing I love most about the Boy Scouts were the projects that we did to help other people. And every time you help someone, you got this internal desire to do even more. So I decided I wanted to go to West Point uh, because there were people living behind the Iron Curtain. There were people living in communist uh, countries that didn't have freedoms. And I thought by going to West Point and being a leader in the Army that uh, I could help make a difference in those people's lives. So even though I graduated toward the top of my class and most of those people tend to go in the Corps of Engineers, I wanted to be in the infantry. So I was one of the first people in my class to go in the infantry. And uh, as you can see in that third picture, I was in the 82nd Airborne Division. As Brenda said, I did Ranger School, Arctic Warfare School, Desert Warfare School, Jungle Warfare School in Panama, uh, Jump Master, uh, and all that prepared me for the next picture, which was to work for Procter & Gamble. <laughs> I, joined, uh, I joined the Procter & Gamble. <laughs> Actually, that was a really funny story until 1991 when my wife and I moved to the Philippines. Um, the previous vice president of the American Chamber of Commerce had been kidnapped by communist rebels there for 39 days. 
So it got so that story wasn't too funny anymore. But my company said, don't worry. Uh, we know you don't want to go to a place where the safety of your children are in danger. So don't worry, we're going to send you to the Philippines with that communist insurgency, but we've hired bodyguards for your children and you. And, uh, but anyway, I joined the Procter & Gamble Company. That's the next picture. That's the first day I joined the Procter & Gamble Company. It's uh, June 4th, 1980. And uh, there are a couple important things you can tell from that picture. Uh, number one, I joined the company because of the purpose of the company, which was to improve the lives of the world's consumers. On any given day, about 5 billion people on the planet use at least one product of the Procter & Gamble Company. But the important insight from that picture is the Procter & Gamble Company has not solved hair loss yet. <laughs> I thought getting out of the military, you know, growing my hair a little bit longer, this is cool, this is a new, a new way to demonstrate my freedom. But as you can see by the fifth picture, uh, something happened in between and I've lost a little bit of hair. I don't know if that was worrying or what. But uh, the next picture, of course, is the one I'm most proud of, which is, um, is the ability to be in a position where I can serve you, which is the veterans of the country. I take this very personally. Uh, when I was interviewed by CBS, uh, before I went around the Skid Row in Los Angeles looking for homeless veterans, uh, they asked me, you know, what was, why was I there? And I, I said, my biggest fear is tonight as I'm walking through Skid Row, I, I pick up a tarpaulin to see if there's a veteran and I find someone who saved my life, someone who checked my parachute before I jumped, somebody who made sure the charge on those mortars was the right charge. Um, fortunately, that night we didn't, but fortunately we also were working to end homelessness in Los Angeles. We have the most noble mission in government. Uh, it was, you know, President Lincoln's second inaugural address when he talked about to care for him who shall born the battle, his widows and his orphans. Today we paraphrase that because, of course, women are very important to us in VA. We talk about to care for those who have borne the battle, their families and their survivors. In the Civil War, over 750,000 soldiers lost their lives. That's 514 Americans every single day for four years. Think about that. 514 Americans every single day for four years. And unlike our, our, our methods today where you wear dog tags and some of us, I, I always had a dog tag in my shoelaces and my boots uh, just in case my neck got separated from my, my, uh, my feet. But, you know, in those days there were no dog tags. And in fact, uh, most of the, uh, the people who died in those battles were buried right on the battlefield. Well, the first inspiration was Lincoln's inaugural address. He created something called the Sanitation Commission, which was the forerunner of our National Cemeteries Administration, where we went out on the battlefields, dug up those mass graves, identified the soldiers. President Lincoln worked with Congress to get national cemeteries, and we reburied those soldiers in all those cemeteries. We notified the families. We were able to identify about two-thirds of the soldiers who were in those mass graves. Uh, which were most of the casualties of the Civil War. So that was an important inspiration for all of us as to the importance of the Veterans uh, Affairs uh, Department in the very beginning. I think we've got a terrific set of values. Uh, we tend to wear these in this button that says, I care, this acronym, integrity, commitment, advocacy, respect, and excellence. It's the way we want you to be treated as veterans. It's the way we want to treat you and uh, we want excellence to be the very best. Our mission is none other than to make sure we have the very best healthcare system in the whole world. And healthcare is just one of those lines of business, but it's one you probably know us most for. Um, in terms of uh, education, you can see here, we spend about $40 billion educating veterans, um, 1.3 million veterans, $1.1 billion in vo vocational rehabilitation and employment, uh, we're one of the largest life insurance companies in the country. We guarantee 2.1 million home loans. Uh, and you know our foreclosure rate is the lowest in the industry. Veterans do not run into financial problems in paying for their mortgages. And I think that's a great testament to all of our veterans. $58 billion in compensation benefits for almost 4 million veterans. Very, very important. Um, in fiscal year 2014, we completed a record number, $1.3 million, or 1.3 million claims. That's uh, over 150,000 more uh, than the previous year's record. 
and uh, we're working hard to get that production rate up even more. We've got the claims backlog down 58% uh, in the last 22 months from 611,000 to 255,000. But you know what, as long as there's any claim and any backlog, we have more work to do. So we're not perfect yet, we're moving in the right direction, but what we're trying to do is put in place a budget and an organization capability to deal with the huge influx of claims, the huge influx of needs that our veterans have after fighting wars for 24 years. There we go. Our goal is to make VA a model agency with respect to customer experience and stewardship of taxpayer resources. We want to be the best example for all government agencies. With efficient and effective operations, we look to be comparable to the very best private sector companies. This is how we will meet our nation's obligations to our veterans. It's worth remembering that today, a full 150 years after the Civil War ground to a halt, we VA are still providing benefits to the child of a Civil War veteran. We still have troops in both Afghanistan and Iraq, and in the last decade we've already seen a dramatic increase in the demand for benefits and care. This chart shows how. For 40 years, from 1960 to the year 2000, the percentage of veterans receiving compensation from VA was relatively stable at 8.5%. But in the last 14 years, since 2001, the percentage has dramatically increased to 19%. That's more than double the previous percentage. And we'll make sure these charts are available to you as you go out to talk to your congressional representatives. Simultaneously, the number of claims so that was about receiving disability compensation. This is about the number of claims. The number of claims and the number of medical issues in rating-related claims has soared. As this chart shows, in 2009, VBA completed almost 980,000 claims. In fiscal year 2017, we project we, project we will complete 1.4 million claims. That's a 47% increase. But there's been an even more dramatic growth in the number of medical issues per claim. 2.7 million in 2009 and a projected 5.9 million in 2017. That's a 115% increase in just over eight years, as this chart shows. Now these increases were accompanied by a dramatic rise in the average degree of disability compensation granted to veterans. For 45 years, from 1950 to 1955, the average degree of disability held steady at 30%. The average veteran with a disability claim had roughly 30% disability. For 40, but since 2000, the year 2000, the average degree of disability has risen to 47.7%, as you can see in this chart. Again, more than, uh, you know, nearly 50% of individuals. So while it's true that the number of veterans is declining, the number of those seeking care and benefits from VA is increasing quite dramatically. Now you know the reasons for this, but let me just lay them out. Several factors uh, contribute to this increase. First, we've been fighting a war for more than a decade. Second, Agent Orange related disability claims. Third, an unlimited claims appeal process, which we're pleased with the uh, fully developed appeal approach that uh, the DAV has been leading. Increased number of medical claims issues, far greater survival rates among those wounded, more sophisticated methods for identifying and treating veterans' medical issues, and huge demographic shifts in this country. The result? Veterans' demand for services and benefits uh, has exceeded VA's capacity to meet them. It's important that the American people understand why this is happening. 
And the most important consideration of those that I mentioned is, uh, I'm sorry, is shown here on this chart. Please look at the, uh, the purple bar in particular. As with any population, healthcare requirements and the demand for benefits both increase as veterans age and exit the worst workforce. This chart shows an astounding shift. In 1975, the year I graduated from West Point, just 40 years ago, only 2.2 million American veterans were 65 years old or older. That's only 7.5% of our veteran population. That's the purple bar. In the year 2017, we expect 9.8 million veterans will be 65 years or older. 46% of the veteran population, nearly half of the veteran population, look at the size of the purple bar. So today we serve a population that is older and more with more chronic conditions and less able to afford private sector care. VA has the greatest opportunity to enhance care for veterans in its history. We see that last year's crisis was a huge opportunity. We're in an extraordinary position. We have an opportunity to not only right the wrongs, but to lengthen our lead in areas where we've always excelled, take the lead in service delivery areas that are lagging, and chart new ground in emerging or evolving areas of healthcare. And we've made progress on some of these already. We've had 37 million appointments, 1.8 million more in our facilities than in the same months last year. 98% were completed within 30 days of preferred or medically necessary date. 880,000 evening or weekend appointments. 2 million authorizations for private sector care. That's a 45% increase in private sector care and that's even before the choice cards were mailed. 55% reduction in electronic wait list from over 57,000 to under 25,800. We hired 836 more physicians, 1,856 more nurses, 1,266 medical support assistants from April to December, and November was our peak hiring month. We're working hard to find the help to work hard for all of us. You're, you, the opportunities are immense, and we're going to work hard on your behalf. Uh, and we can help, and all of you can help, find us the people that we need in order to get this done. One of the, we have many incentives now, thanks to members of Congress and the work that we've done with members of Congress, in order to hire more people. We now can repay the education debt of a doctor that that's been increased from $60,000 a year, um, $60,000 uh, of reimbursement to $120,000 over a five-year service period, and that's helping us recruit more doctors. We can now uh, repay student loans uh, to lending institutions up to $10,000 per year with a lifetime cap of $60,000 if they're working to work, if they're willing to work for three years for the VA. Employee incentive uh, scholarship program that provides scholarships to employees for degrees or training in selected health carriers. We can cover tuition and some living expenses. We've increased pay ranges for physicians so that when they come to work at the VA, we can be competitive with the private sector. We've done the same thing for dentists. Uh, we have a compensation, a comprehensive pay and compensation packages commensurate with, uh, with education which will allow us to recruit more doctors and more nurses. And we're soon beginning a pilot program for mental health professionals that was included in the recently approved and signed Clay Hunt Act. We're also undergoing the largest restructuring in the department's history. This is a historic department-wide transformation. We're changing VA's culture and making the veteran the center of everything that we do. The focus of uh, my VA, what we're calling it, and the reason we're calling it that is we really want you to think of the VA as your own. We want you to feel like you have a customized program just for you uh, from the VA. 
We're focusing on five objectives. Number one is to improve the veteran experience so that every veteran has a seamless, integrated, and responsive customer service experience every single time they interact with the VA. Number two is we have to improve the employee experience and eliminate the barriers that employees see to providing great customer service to achieving people excellence amongst employees so employees can better serve veterans. If we don't take care of our employees, there's no way we can expect those employees to better take care of veterans. Number three, we need to improve our internal support services within VA. Number four, we need to establish a culture of continuous improvement so local levels can identify and correct problems more immediately and then replicate those proven solutions across the entire VA facilities. Number five, importantly, is enhancing strategic partnerships. And of course, we think that our partnerships with uh, veteran service organizations like DVA, DAV are absolutely critical. Again, we intend every single veteran to have a delightful experience with VA every time that you interact with VA. We're also in the process of reorganizing the, the department geographically, uh, which is an important first step to simplification. We have had nine lines of business. Each line of business has had its own geographic map and its own middle management. We're moving to one geographic map, the one you see here, that will have five regions. Uh, in the past, those nine dis disjointed geographic maps will come together into one. We'll have one structure, one organization, simplify it so veterans know where to go, who to talk to, and have a customer service organization that will reach out to you and work on your behalf. In terms of strategic partnerships, we've set up a new office of strategic partnerships. We want to create a national network of community veteran uh, advisory councils. Uh, we want to drive responsibility in VA down closer to where the veteran is so that decisions can be made at the local level as to how uh, resources need to be moved to better care for the veterans uh, in their geography. We're in the process of working to leverage external resources. We're setting up an external advisory board that will involve uh, a lot of experts uh, in the industry as well as people in the private sector who can help us benchmark how to better care for customers. We're talking to people like Disney, like uh, USAA, like uh, Starbucks to find out how you train people to better care for customers so that we can provide those kind of delightful experiences. But obviously, it's important to get the budget and the capability to do all this. Uh, this budget requests $168.8 billion, $73.5 billion in discretionary funds, and $95.3 billion in mandatory funds. Uh, as you can see here, this is a, a large increase in discretionary funding of 7.5%, a large increase in medical care funding of 7.4%, and a large increase in funding in the benefits area of 6.6%. This budget will increase access to medical care and benefits for veterans. It will address the infrastructure challenges including major and minor construction, modernization, and renovation. Most of our buildings are over 70 years old. Now that we have an influx of female veterans, about 11, 12% of our veterans are female, we don't have the clinical space to put in women's veterans. I can tell you hospitals uh, now that build operating rooms, the operating rooms are 50% to 100% bigger than they were 70 years ago. Why? Because when you do an operation now, it involves robotics, it involves computers, it involves bandwidth. We need larger hospital rooms. We just need to overhaul the facilities that we have. We need to fund medical and prosthetics research. And we also have to address this IT infrastructure and modernization issue that we have. While this is a very, very large increase and we understand that, it's not enough. It's not enough. Um, it's not sufficient to meet all the requirements in either 2016 or 2017. So one of the things I've asked for Congress for is flexibility. Flexibility so that if you decide you want to use the choice card, we can fund that. If you decide you want to use the VA, we can fund that. 
Right now in the VA, we have 70 line items of budget that we can't move money from one line item to the other. And there's tremendous uncertainty with the choice card. We are very much in favor of the choice card. We think it's a great idea. We want you to be able to get the care wherever you want to get it. But so far, we haven't seen a great uptake on the choice card. And we're estimating that the choice card usage could vary anywhere from $3.8 billion over the three-year period to $12.9 billion over that three-year period. That's a $9 billion difference. All we're asking the Congress is over time, if you decide not to use the choice card and you come to the VA, we want to have the ability to take that budget money and move it to the VA. Or if you decide to overuse the choice card and go beyond the 12 billion, we want to have the money to move from VA to the choice card. That's all we've been asking is for flexibility, like every business in the country would have in order to meet the consumer need. Again, it's all about your choice not ours. So we want to just be there where you are. I want to talk briefly before I close about the importance of the caregiver program uh, because I know you're going to be talking about it later. Uh, we have clinical experts on caregiver issues. We provide information to all veterans and caregivers on available services, both VA and non-VA. Again, we can't do it all ourselves. And uh, one at every, we have one caregiver coordinator at every one of our medical center facilities. So if you haven't met them, please, please reach out and meet them. We also have a caregiver service line. Uh, the phone number there is 855-260-3274, 855-260-3274. We respond to inquiries about caregiver services. We provide referrals to local caregivers. Uh, we provide emotional support. And uh, we've received about 150,000 calls so far, which average about 150 calls per day. So it's not insignificant. Uh, we think caregiving is incredibly important. We want to stand up a new advisory council for the secretary and for the VA uh, of caregiving experts. We want to have a caregiver conference where we bring all caregiving experts together. We think that it's important to shine a light on caregiving for the national audience. And uh, we know that you'd like to work with us and we want to partner with you on expanding caregivers. Last year we partnered with the Easter Seal Disability uh, Services. We developed four new self-care training courses for caregivers, um, but we know that's not enough and we know we have a lot more to do. We have over two dozen caregiver partnerships. Uh, one, of course, one very important one is with the DAV, but of course we want to go further. I know I probably haven't covered every single issue you wanted me to, uh, so I would like to close simply by saying if you have any questions or any comments, uh, please either give me a call or email me. My email address is very, very simple. It's bob.mcdonald at va.gov, bob.mcdonald at va.gov. Write to me, call me anytime. I would love to hear from you. If you forget how to spell McDonald, just go outside and look for the golden arches. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I take it that isn't E I E I O, is it? <laughs> uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> Forget what I said about your labor. Okay. <laughs> At this time, I would like to ask Commander Hope to come up. He has a, a presentation he'd like to make. Ladies and gentlemen, last year many veterans felt a breach of trust resulting from the access issues at a VA. We too understood challenges or changes had to be made to ensure veterans were properly cared for in a timely fashion. We're now six months under the VA's new leadership and we're seeing a number of long needed changes taking place. Secretary McDonald has announced a large scale organization restructuring under the My VA initiative to realign care, services, and benefits in a way that offers veterans a more integrated, responsive VA system. We have seen VA leaders held accountable and removed for their part in the access crisis uncovered last year. And we've seen an increased VA budget request 
announced earlier this month, which is something DAV has been requesting for years. In the military, you're recognized for your accomplishments, but also for your potential. At six months, there's still a lot of work to be done at VA. We can all agree on that. But it's also true that the Secretary, Bob as he likes to be called, has brought about some large scale changes and has more plans on the horizon to fix the bureaucracy that has at times hindered the process for veterans to receive their earned care and benefits. For his efforts thus far to restore the faith of veterans and more importantly as a gesture of faith and confidence in his continued work to improve and strengthen the VA, we'd like to present DAV's Outstanding Federal Executive of the Year Award for 2014 to Secretary Bob McDonald. Thank you very much. I, I, I must say to you that uh, with, with great humility that I accept this and also uh, with your intention that uh, this causes me to work harder, not relax. I see lots of nodding heads. Thank you very much. I agree. Um, this will energize all of us in the department. You know, there, there are people who want us to fail and we don't want to fail. We're, most of us are veterans. We're here for veterans to do veterans things. And this will do nothing but energize all of us in the department to work even harder on your behalf. So I thank you very much for this recognition. It's with all humility that I accept it. And I want to thank DAV for their partnership. Uh, we could not do this without you. And we look forward to working together to get it done. Thank you very much.